Hi, and welcome to the App Excellence Summit. I'm Sarah Karam, and I'm the Director of Apps Partnerships for Google Play and Android. We're grateful that you are joining us, and we're excited for the conversations we'll have together today. You might be wondering why we decided to build out a whole summit on the topic of app excellence. You might also be asking, what is app excellence? App excellence is a wide-ranging topic with a narrow common theme, a laser focus on the user. Ensuring your app is intuitive and that people can realize the value of your product as quickly and seamlessly as possible is key. Excellent apps perform well, no matter the device used. And today, more than ever, that consistency across devices really matters. More people are consuming apps from their living rooms, their cars, wrists, schools, offices, and buds than ever before. Apps that delight us across screens and environments will have the best chance of retaining users. People tend to share whether they think an app is excellent or not via ratings and reviews. We know the importance of ratings on the Play Store to your business. Your app's user rating is a metric that stakeholders across the organization care about. Ratings reflect how people react to your app and help guide potential users when they are deciding to install your app or not. When learning more about what drives ratings, we saw an interesting trend. People have high expectations of apps and limited patience for quality issues. Over half of users who left a one-star review across the Play Store mentioned app stability and bugs. This makes the quality of your app a critical driver of business success, keeping the users you have and acquiring new ones. For app businesses, there is no universal recipe for excellence. The one thing that is absolute is that all stakeholders who influence the app should be invested in the experience of using it, no matter if you're in the product, engineering, marketing, or customer support teams. However, we have heard from some companies that getting everyone across an organization aligned on the importance of app excellence has its challenges, especially when there is pressure to release more and more new features. Today, you will hear some insightful case studies that share some consistent themes about what helped drive some of that organizational alignment. Having shared accountability. Key measures of app quality, such as crashes and load times, are often seen as the sole responsibility of one group in the company, such as the engineering team. But sometimes, issues with quality are driven by wider business or product decisions, such as focusing on new feature rollouts. You will hear a great case study from Headspace later today on this very topic. Ensuring everyone across teams has responsibility for user experience is key. We also see companies who have successfully improved their app experience tend to take a more balanced approach to how they prioritize development efforts, taking into account stakeholder objectives, maintenance of core features, and user feedback. And this means the whole organization needs to make conscious trade-offs and understand the consequences between features that can drive revenue in the short term and how they might affect the overall performance of your app and user experience and the longer term success of your business. So what's coming up? In a few minutes, I will be joined by Casey Winters, Chief Product Officer at Eventbrite. Casey helps companies scale as an advisor with Greylock Partners and also as a veteran product leader working with companies such as Grubhub and Pinterest. We will discuss Casey's thoughts on enabling growth with a focus on app excellence. Immediately after my chat with Casey, you will have access to a number of on-demand video sessions available for you to watch and share with your colleagues, including detailed case studies from Headspace, Duolingo, Lyft, and Google Maps on how they prioritized and addressed app excellence in their teams. Finally, be sure to watch an overview of protecting user privacy to deliver excellent app experiences. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Android App Excellence Summit.
Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to kick off the summit with a fireside chat with Casey Winters. Welcome, Casey. Thank you for being here. Hi. Um, before we dig in, I'm going to share a brief intro of Casey. Um, Casey Winters is the Chief Product Officer at Eventbrite, where he manages PM, design, research, and growth marketing. Before Eventbrite, he led growth at GrubUp and at Pinterest. Casey was also a growth advisor at Greylock Partners and advised companies such as Airbnb, Reddit, Canva, Fair, and Thumbtack. He runs an excellent blog for product leaders at caseyaccidental.com and builds training programs at Reforge. Um, Casey, it's great to have you here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, why don't we start? Yeah, thanks. Why don't we start by hearing a bit more about your journey and what led you to do this work? Um, could you share your story with us? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so I started my career as an analyst at apartments.com. It was my job to measure the effectiveness of everything we we're doing to drive leads to our rental properties. And it was a really good way to learn about all these acquisition channels that were native to the internet that we definitely were not hearing about in marketing classes at the time. So naturally, once I understood them, I started working directly on improving them. And these were things like AdWords, SEO, email marketing, affiliate marketing. And as I tried to connect all that work to the product experience, the company gave me this feedback of that I was a weird product and marketing hybrid, and they didn't know what to do with that. So I worked on a lot of entrepreneurial projects there uh, until Grubhub came along. And they had just raised their 1 million Series A, and they wanted just me to grow the number of people who ordered food. They didn't care how I did it. I could change the product. I could you know, work on marketing things. So I did all of that, uh, you know, built features, built loyalty programs, spent money on AdWords, spent money on uh, out of home television, you know, optimized for conversion, SEO, uh, did all the things to try to like grow the demand side of the business, I ended up growing it from 30,000 users to 3 million. Uh, and shortly before uh, Grubhub's IPO, I, I moved over to Pinterest and they now had a name for the type of stuff that I felt like I did, which was called growth. Uh, so I joined the growth product team, uh, ended up leading that team and grew uh, Pinterest from 40 million active users to 150 million uh, active users. Uh, when I left Pinterest, I, I realized that uh, I'd been lucky to work on a couple of these you know, early stage to IPO bound businesses. And a lot of the startups that were growing around the time, it was just a lot of first time founders, a lot of first time executives who were winging it. They didn't really know how well they were doing. So. I really just focused on helping them understand how to scale a business. Uh, so uh, you mentioned some of the companies like Airbnb, Tinder, uh, Eventbrite, Thumbtack were, were some of my early clients. And I just really liked the culture of Eventbrite. So when they opened the chief product officer role, I took it um, and I've been there almost three years now. Awesome. Yeah, I love that you give back to the community, sharing your insights uh, from those early days when growth wasn't even a thing. Um, so, you know, today in the summit, we're focused on a specific driver of growth, um, namely the importance of excellent user experiences. When you think of excellence in terms of app experience, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, I tend to focus on does the app provide clear value to the user and how obvious is it to get to that value? And that could be you have this amazing intuitive experience or that you're just very directed to the user on how to get to that. Uh, value and designing something completely intuitive on a device that's you know only a decade old pretty hard um so a lot of what i tend to focus on is building a great onboarding experience that teaches the user how to get value quickly if it's obvious how to get value great great job i think you know 99 percent of companies can't get there so what's a lot easier is building an onboarding experience that teaches them the right things to do to be able to get that value uh you know, Scott Belsky, who's the chief product officer at Adobe, he has this concept of a, the product development life cycle, which is users flock to simple products. Those products take users for granted and add more and more features for power users, and then users flock from them to other simple products. So at Eventbrite, uh, we have this a diversity of event creators, some of whom need a, just a very simple product to launch a very simple event, all the way to creators who are running super complicated events and businesses on our platform. So we try to keep the default product experience super simple and then have hidden power for those more advanced users that need it. Um, and then when people need those features, we want to make it obvious like how to get value out of them and how to find them. And we've been searching for a term to define that philosophy. And our, our best uh, name for it so far is perceived simplicity. Uh, so that's really the North Star of excellence for us. Are we maintaining that perceived simplicity as a product? 
Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of North Stars, you know, something that you've written quite a lot about is the metrics and, you know, how do you, what do you prioritize as you think about um, growth levers? Uh, I was interested to read um, your perspective on the categories of metrics. So thinking about um, the roles of, of input metrics versus North Stars. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, uh, I've I've always found the whole concept of a North Star metric a bit reductive. You know, many of us are running pretty complex businesses. There's no one metric that can align everything the business needs to do uh, to be successful. And for me, I've mostly worked on, on network driven products in my career. There's always trade offs between metrics and a healthy balance that needs to be achieved to maximize success between say, you know, creators and, you know, people uh, who buy tickets to their events or restaurants and people who order, you know, food from them. Um, when I joined Pinterest, we had just a top level North Star metric, was M which was MAU. And as a growth leader, I found that super easy to game. Like I could just send a couple of notifications, get people back into the product and, uh, you know, oh, MAUs went up, but the engagement wasn't really there. So we then tried switching to a more engaging metric, but we ended up combining uh, a couple of different engagement elements. And then people naturally started optimizing for the easier one of the two, uh, which wasn't really what uh, we wanted either. Um, so instead, what I try to do now is map the growth model of the entire business, measure the really key elements of that growth model, and then on a regular time frame, determine which metrics we're really focused on improving, what metrics we're monitoring to improve the efficiency of that growth model so that you know the business can grow faster and, and more sustainably. Uh, and really just trying to find the leverage in that model. And you know, you're not always going to get it right at, at first, but if you keep poking at it, you'll find the areas of leverage over time. Yeah, I love that because it feels like it has the best of all worlds where you you know what inputs go in, but you also are really thinking about the broader picture. Um, You've written about the red queen effect uh, and how important it is when investing in product excellence. What is it and why should product leaders care about it? Yeah, so the red queen effect is this concept from uh, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. Alice is talking to the red queen and she says, hey, you know, if you run very fast for a long time, you generally get somewhere else. And, you know, the red queen responds, what a slow sort of country you come from. Here, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you need to run twice as fast. So in business and in nature, the Red Queen effect is this concept of increased pressure to adapt faster just to survive, to stay in the same place. So there's a lot of business examples that reference the Red Queen effect. And they talk mainly about how competitors are innovating just as fast as you. So you need to keep innovating just to keep pace with the market. But I prefer to think of it as you're in a race to keep up with the expectations of your customers, not competitors. So what I mean by that is product market fit has like a positive slope, like customer expectations, like increase uh, over time. And uh, if you aren't consistently improving your user experience and the value you generate over time, you can lose product market fit, you know, with your target audience. So uh, what this means and from a product development perspective is Many times by investing in something, you may not see a metric improvement you know, to say improving the user experience or something, but you prevented a metrics loss sometime down the line by making that investment now. Um, so, you know, at Pinterest to make sure that didn't happen, we basically made a key result on the growth team that we would audit our, our top user flows uh, for user experience just every quarter. And we'd make improvements uh, from the design team without an expectation that they'd move, say, our key metrics up. It was just defensive to make sure those metrics wouldn't go down over time. Uh, at Eventbrite, we're doing something a little bit less hacky today. Uh, one of our key results is this product experience score. And it's a survey-based metric that covers like the ease of use and the value delivered for our customers. And our goal is to drive that metric um, to be really high because we want to be one of the best tools for SMBs out there. Uh, and we also do a similar survey like that for some of our key features. We're just measuring usage isn't going to like tell the entire story. You might have to use that feature, but it doesn't mean you like it. And in that case, we want to you know measure uh, you know how valuable it is to you, not just that you actually are using it. Yeah, building on that topic of of measurement, um, you know we know and you've shared how important it is to think of quality of experience as an input metric as you think about the broader growth story. However, you know we often hear from a lot of the teams um, who work on building apps at their companies that building a business case for the technical investment required 
to maintain or fix foundational app experiences um, instead of you know launching some cool hot new feature um, is challenging. Um, so do you have any guidance for how to build a strong business case for invest investing in foundational user experiences? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is something I prioritize heavily, but it does depend on the stage of the company you're at. So if you're an early stage startup, uh, you shouldn't be building super scalable experiences. You should be willing to take on tech debt and design debt to validate that your strategies work and to be able to grow fast enough to secure that next milestone, whether it's more funding or whatever. But later stage companies need to balance investment and growth versus scalability. And as a chief product officer, I think of my core responsibility is to understand this allocation of resources across things that help the product scale, things that grow products usage, things that make the product more valuable, et cetera. And that portfolio mix needs to shift dramatically over time. Uh, and what I find is almost all companies underinvest in the scaling the product piece once they've found product market fit. Um, most of the time, I'd say this, this underinvestment is about two issues. One is not understanding engineering leverage. And two is not understanding, you know, to the previous point about how product market fit works, that like it really does have a, a positive slope. So, you know, what I try to espouse to the teams I work with, as well as advise, is that engineering velocity is just the purest form of leverage a software company can have. So the faster engineers can build things, the more value we can then create for the customer, uh, the faster we can learn, the more the business can grow, et cetera. But it is like this derivative of customer value. It's not customer value in and of itself uh, that you're investing in uh, with developer velocity. So what we did at Eventbrite is we built a measurement plan and a goal the rest of the company could understand related to investing in developer experience. Uh, so we basically said by investing in our infrastructure, we could make it feel like there were X more engineers at the company than there actually were because each engineer would have much less downtime and be able to work that much more efficiently. Um, and that mean we'd be able to deliver X new things we wouldn't be able to deliver after that investment was complete. And we started measuring engineering downtime and sprint velocity to prove it. Um, and, and that was successful. Uh, at Pinterest, we faced a similar issue that I think a lot of developers face, which is around performance. Um, so our front end framework was getting pretty slow, especially in other countries, but no one wanted to invest in it. It was kind of like in between ownership of a lot of areas. Uh, so what we did on the growth team is we built an experiment just for our large doubt pages, which is you know a small percentage of our experience to really grind down on performance and run it as an A-B test to see what impact it have on our metrics. And we achieved a 30% improvement in what we call perceived user wait time. And that led to a conversion increase and a traffic increase from Google of over 10%. So that gave us enough buy-in to make that investment for the entire product. So are there these ways that you can like do a little bit of investment to show the value and then get like the rest of the company really bought in is something I advise teams to do whenever they can. Yeah. I mean, you spoke here about getting that cross company buy-in is, is really important. Um, from your work at Eventbrite, Eventbrite and Pinterest and, and as, a, as an advisor, um, what are some best practices you've observed uh, when trying, when you see teams enabling cross-team collaboration and how to do that really effectively? Yeah, I, I think both companies are on this journey to make cross-functional teams and cross-functional shared OKRs or goals the default of how we build products. So there are times where that doesn't make sense, I'll admit. You might need a GM-like structure for whatever you're building, but a lot of why I started doing this advising full-time was just to teach the framework that we had unlocked at Pinterest to other companies. So you know, if you take growth at Eventbrite today, uh, so I manage the product managers and the designers and the growth marketers that work on growth. But tomorrow, our CMO manages the content and the creative teams that, that work on growth. And then Vivek, our CTO, manages the engineers who work on growth. Mm -hmm. But they all share the exact same growth goals, and they're just bringing their unique talents together uh, as one cross-functional team to achieve those goals. So whenever you can align those incentives between all the different skill sets you need to achieve the goal, whether it's growth, whether it's user experience, whatever, um, I tend that uh tends to drive the best result it can be a little bit slower out of the gate because you're aligning more people but then you can move much faster for the long term because you're not you know battling each other having different priorities yeah yeah awesome yeah certainly something we aspire to do uh, at google um, but you know i think every team can can relate to those challenges of cross-functional alignment 
Um, switching gears a little bit uh, related to the last couple of years that we've all been we've all been facing, uh, we've seen some interesting shifts in user behavior in the devices people are using. Um, could be related to the pandemic or new form factors like watches and foldables gaining more traction. How are you thinking about user experience and excellence across devices? Yeah, so you know, I always go back to that you know Steve Jobs YouTube video. There, an engineer tries to insult you know Steve that he hasn't built anything for a while, um, and you know what he basically says is that you know you shouldn't be building technology for technology's sake. You need to start with the customer, understand their problem, and then figure out you know the right technology that can help solve that. Um, and you know whenever a new technology comes along, let you know you know a, a while back it was like machine learning or NFC, and and now you see it in crypto. There's all this excitement to try to see well what can I use this for? Um, so with new devices like like what you're mentioning, you have to understand what problem those new devices can help solve for your customer. And then if the customers of those devices overlap with your customer, you know, uh, you know, how can those new devices better help your customer solve the problem that, you know, uh, they hire your company to solve? Um, so I, if you think of a more basic example with, with mobile apps, you know, Eventbrite has mobile apps for both consumers and event creators. Uh, but the creator app really just focuses on the ticket scanning job of, you know, when you show up in an event, you know, the, the creator can scan your ticket verify it's real, and then they know who showed up. Um, we have not prioritized jamming all of our other features related to you know, marketing or event creation you know, inside that app, because we feel like that's really something better done as a deep work you know, on a computer when you really have time set aside, not something to do on the go. Um, and that's really just understanding how our creators want to operate and, and what value we can create for them with these different devices. Um, and of course, you know that opinion could change over time. You know, moving into more countries where mobile devices are the only devices people have could change that, or just more comfort or simplicity in you know creating or marketing events. Um, but it's you're really trying to think about with all these new devices, with all these two new technologies. Um, how do they help the customer and, and don't jam it in if it's not going to help. Um, but if it can, it can, it can potentially unlock something totally new, like ticket scanning, which is something we, we can't even do, you know, on, on a laptop. Now we can do it on the phone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely resonates to focus on what, sol what problem you're solving um, for, for the user. Um, maybe, you know, building on that, um, as product leaders, it's always exciting to launch new features. And often many teams are, are incentivized, um, and that's kind of how, how systems are set up. Um, so thinking about that, how do you balance prioritizing new features with your team versus investing in fixing foundational basics? Yeah, you know, it goes back to that understanding of the growth model I talked about earlier of, you know, your users and where there is leverage uh, in solving for them. So, you know, my background prior to Eventbrite was mostly working on growth, right? And, and growth tends to be the dominant strategy for these post-product market fit network effect businesses. You know, more restaurants is always a better feature than extra filters um, when you're searching for food uh, for like the Grubhub example. Um, but with Eventbrite, I have barely worked on the growth side of product at all for the first couple of years because in understanding our growth model, we really needed to revamp our core platform for these emerging use cases that were where all the growth was and that we weren't necessarily super well positioned for. Uh, and we were confident in that because we had mapped how our platform grew, what our issues were for our target audience, who our target audience was. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I really try to big by default because the answer when you model growth could be, oh, we just need new features. Right. but uh, sometimes it could be, we just need to focus on connecting more people with our existing features, or we need to invest in you know, reducing tech debt so we can move faster, et cetera. Um, in thinking about you know, features, I wrote this post uh, a while back called Feature Product Fit, and we've now adapted it into a Reforge program called Product Strategy. But the, the idea behind feature development is features have to become valuable to your users. And you don't get to work on new things until the last feature either proves it has feature product fit, it's it's made the product more valuable, or you delete it because it didn't get there. Um, so we, we built this concept for Reforge called TARS, which is like, who's the target audience? Um, did they adopt the feature you built? Did they retain using the feature you built? And are they satisfied with the feature you built? Um, and we try to measure that for everything and, and make a decision over like whether we're keeping this feature and investing in it or not. Um, uh, 
uh, using that framework. And it's surprising how few companies are measuring each of those individual components uh, and just moving on to the next thing. It's not really setting your product up for long-term success. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and a minute ago, Casey, uh, you were talking about other ways you were measuring uh, user satisfaction. You talked about the survey that you've been doing at Eventbrite. Could you speak more about how you set that up? I imagine our audience might be curious to learn more about um, that approach versus you know another another way to measure input metrics. Yeah, for sure. So at the at the overall product level, you know, it's basically going and emailing active creators in the case of the creator side of the product and asking them a series of questions that evaluate, uh, you know, how aware you are of our features, how easy they are to use when you have a problem, can you solve it yourself and how well does it solve the problem you intended to solve? And then at the feature level, you know, we trigger a survey based on you actually using something like say reporting inside our product. And then we ask those questions specifically related to the reporting element or a product. And we basically build a percentage score of, you know, of the people we surveyed um, at a, you know, a score out of five on like how well the feature meets their needs, um, how many people answered four out of five out of the total. And we get a percentage score from that. And then our, our like key result as a product team is to try to move that score up. We probably will never get to 100%, um, but if we continue making progress, we know we're adding value for our audience. Awesome. Maybe Casey, in the last minute uh, or two, if you could leave this audience who are all you know focused on, on building the best possible user experiences with one piece of advice on how to do this effectively, um, especially kind of now during this time where uh, we're all kind of overwhelmed with being, you know, in a hybrid world and, uh, you know, being uh, on our phones and on our devices so much. What, what guidance would you give them on, on how to stay laser focused on this? When in doubt, talk to the user, right? Like, uh, yeah, that's really where we started with Eventbrite when I joined is just talking to a bunch of users, understanding their problems and you know, if you're ignoring core experience or if you're not building the things that they need, they're going to tell you pretty quickly. Uh, and that can really help you prioritize the right things for long-term success. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. Wise words. Um, it's been a pleasure, pleasure chatting with you, Casey. Um, what's the best way for people to read more about your thoughts and uh, keep up to date with you on social media? Yeah, so I tweet at, at one caseman on Twitter. I blog at caseyaccidental.com and I teach programs on product and growth at, at reforge.com. Awesome. I can personally vouch for the Reforge program. Uh, myself and some team members had taken it a while back and it was really, really worthwhile. Yeah, highly recommend it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time with us. Um, everyone who's uh, staying on, please do stay on for the videos um, that we have and, and the panels later. Um, thank you all for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of the summit.